a project in Myanmar where everything actually worked. <laughs> where government, instead of being too afraid to do anything at all, actually said, you know what? We want to innovate. We want to approve promising new projects by innovative new companies. And we'll try it out. And you know what? We won't understand what the heck is going on in the beginning, because it's new. We have no idea what's going on, but we'll stick with it, because we want to see what works and what doesn't work. Imagine a development aid organization. <laughs> this development aid organization, instead of having hotel event after hotel event, writing white paper after white paper, actually use their considerable resources, financing, and technical know-how to empower promising, innovative local organizations, giving them the opportunity and the resources to try interesting, innovative new projects. And this development aid organization, using its considerable brand prestige and reputation, worked with the government to convince them to approve projects run by these interesting, innovative, young organizations. And finally, imagine a local Myanmar organization staffed by energetic, young, talented Myanmar people who have the technical know-how, the drive, and ambition to build a better Myanmar. And imagine that these young people, instead of bemoaning wow, I really don't have any opportunities or money, saying, wow, development aid and government is really helping us so we can build a better Myanmar. You all think I'm crazy. I know. I've totally lost my mind. But last month at the World Economic Forum, Dal Aung San Suu Kyi said something very interesting. She talked about the importance of preparing Myanmar's young people for the fourth industrial revolution. And so what is this fourth industrial revolution? The fourth industrial revolution is happening right now. It is, it involves artificial intelligence, it involves machine learning, it involves 3D printing, it involves robotics, it involves self-driving cars. And now you think I've really lost it because you're like, okay, okay buddy, tell Elon Musk, to bring his Tesla self-driving car on the streets of Yungle, that thing will be completely destroyed in 30 seconds. <laughs> and you're right, obviously you're right, clearly you're right. But consider, consider this. In the not too distant future, say five years from now, five years, the year is 2023. A young, uh, pregnant Myanmar woman, uh, this is my co-founder's wife actually when she was pregnant, wakes up in a rural village. Uh, she and her husband are farmers. Like every single other Myanmar people, person, she picks up her smartphone. She turns on her smartphone, and being pregnant, she says in Burmese into the smartphone, uh, I'm pregnant. I should probably meet with a doctor. A pregnancy app automatically opens up. It lists the doctors located near her village who are trained in antenatal clinic visits. She selects the one she likes, she calls the doctor, and sets up an appointment later in the week. She also gets an alert from her smartphone saying, um, you and your husband have not paid your taxes and you have not paid your water or your electricity bills. We are gonna contact the local government and that local government's gonna remotely turn off your water and, pow and power using the internet of things, IoT powered smart meter installed in your household. She says, uh, I really like having water and electricity. So she says into her smartphone, let's say she's Kachin, she speaks in her smartphone in Kachin this time, uh, I wanna pay my bills. A chatbot opens up, showing her all her outstanding bills. She puts in the amount she wants to pay. She pays using any central bank approved digital payment method she wants. Wave money, or do, on go, KBZ pay, CB bank, whatever. The payment is automatically settled. 
The government's account is credited. Her account's automatically debited. The Internet of Things smart meter does not take revenge on her. Her water and power remains on. By the way, since we all know not many Myanmar people pay their bills today or taxes, this results in, let's say, up to a thousand percent increase in government revenues. The government, flush with cash, can now build a road running through her village. This is good because she and her husband happen to be farmers and want to sell their crops to market, and now a truck can come into her village, pick up the crops, and take those crops to market. So she says into her phone, let's say she's Shan now, she says into her phone in Shan, um, I want to sell my crops to the highest bidder. An app, e-commerce app opens up, it shows the listing of her crop inventory that's previously collected with the prices. She selects the prices she wants. She clicks confirm. A truck gets a sell order, tells it to come into this village. She and her husband load the crops onto the truck. The, her account is automatically credited with the, uh, with the buyer's money. And a tricky little software algorithm is running in the background, tracking her transactions over time, and saying, hey, uh, her credit's pretty good. And generating a quasi-credit score, and then she gets an alert from a microfinance uh, uh, app saying, why don't you take out a microfinance or SME loan? It lists the loans uh, competitively offered by several providers. She selects the one she wants, and then the uh, microfinance loan amount is instantly credited into her account. She and her husband are happy because they can expand her business. What I'm telling you is not science fiction, okay? What if I told you that this is not only possible in 2023, but it is being built today? It's being built today. We have the technology. We have the software. We have the power today. And now, now I've kind of lost all credibility with you. You're like, this guy's, how'd this guy get on stage? He's completely nuts. So this is what a delayed introduction looks like. I'm Michael Lewin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of CocoTech. CocoTech is an IT social enterprise located in Yangon. Today we have about 90 employees. We're kind of on this hiring street, the number keeps changing. 85 of those employees are Myanmar nationals. About two thirds of them are women. We have about 40 software developers. All of them are Myanmar nationals. Half of them are women. Uh, we have uh, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians on staff. We have ethnic Bama. We have many ethnic nationalities on staff. We, frankly, everybody's mixed. That's actually the real situation. And that's intentional. We are intentionally hiring for diversity from the beginning because we believe that we can show Myanmar that diversity is a strength of the country. It is not a weakness. And so the pregnancy app I'm talking about that's our Maymay app. We're, we're, we're building that today. The Maymay app has 200,000 registered users, 150,000 quizzes taken by pregnant women every month on maternal and child health. There's 1,500 population services international PSI doctors in the app. Uh, and we're not the only ones working on it. PSI, uh, World Vision, uh, the Myanmar Ministry of Health is developing content for the app. Bridge, Save the Children, UNICEF are doing this remarkable national campaign you're seeing right now, uh, emphasizing the importance for new mothers to exclusively breastfeed their children for the first six months of the baby's life. First six months, exclusively breastfeed. That tax and utilities app I was telling you about, we've been building that for the last almost three years now, with the Asia Foundation and municipal governments in Myanmar, five townships. We've been digitizing 150,000 paper records. Actually, that's already done. We're working on the next 150,000. And this digitization has reduced the amount of time it took the munici municipalities to collect taxes from six months to two months and increased the revenues by 15%. 40 additional townships won in. The next thing we're working on is a tax and utilities digital payment. You'll probably be able to do that before the end of this year, maybe the end of this month. And then our IoT developers are constructing smart electric meters and power meters because about 
depending on the township, 50% of governmental revenues is lost due to leakage or the inability to accurately calculate consumption. Again, we are doing this today. It's not science fiction. We have a team of almost 100 people, almost all Myanmar, working on this today. Uh, and so, how do we make sure that this fourth industrial revolution that we're starting to build actually happens, right? How do we make sure that the 2023 case, I'm telling you, that we either achieve it uh, or are on the way to it? So two actors are important. One, development aid. Two, government. Development aid. Before anyone gets so upset, we love development aid. All right, we would not, Cooper Tech would not exist without development aid. It's absolutely essential. So, my point is not a problem with development aid in general. We, it's very important to us. But there are some actors in development aid who are still operating on their old model that the local people of the country couldn't possibly develop the software. You have to outsource from foreign IT firms, and you have to go with reliable, reliable, established IT firms, so they require millions of dollars in annual revenues before you, before you can even uh, uh, get the project. This is wrong. This is misguided. In software, as all of you know by using Facebook and Google, the software changes literally every month. So what we encourage de some development organizations to do is to shift their mindset to the development aid organizations we work with, who have a great mindset, which is, Wow, Myanmar is a greenfield. We could totally leapfrog because it doesn't have any legacy systems. Let's build really innovative new software. Wait a second. There's a lot of really talented local Myanmar people who actually have superior software knowledge to uh, established companies located in other countries. And what we've learned is older IT companies tend to have older tech. That's all we ask of development aid. Government's even more important. And government is aware of this. President Wimnet, in a recent speech, has said, right up there, government needs to be less risk averse. Government shouldn't promise projects and funding that it then doesn't go forward with. We agree. He's totally right. The president is totally right. And there are actors in government who also agree with us. And so what we humbly suggest to government leaders in their 60s and 70s is, remember what it was like to be young. Remember what it was like to have your whole life ahead of you, to have energy and drive to want to make your mark on the world. Don't be afraid. Instead, approve promising R&D projects run by your fellow country people who are younger in their 20s and 30s. And guess what? Some of them are going to fail. The only way we're all going to learn what works and doesn't work is by letting people try and knowing that some will fail, and from that knowledge, knowing what doesn't work. And here's maybe the more interesting result. A lot of them will succeed. We've had failures, believe me, but a lot of our work is succeeding. And that is extremely important. If you give young, young Myanmar people the opportunity to both fail and succeed, you will give them the feeling of hope. You will give them the feeling that their dreams can be realized, that they can actually build and improve their own country. The value on this feeling of hope is priceless. Myanmar is in the news now, and frankly, most of it's bad news. And the bad news is important. It is important that it's reported. It is important that the truth is be reported. But there's also some corners of light in Myanmar. There are young people working together with forward-thinking development aid organizations and forward-thinking uh, Myanmar government actors who are actually starting to build the fourth industrial revolution in Myanmar. If all of government, development aid, private sector, local organizations can come together and young Myanmar people in their, young, in their 20s and 30s can be provided with the financing, resources, 
technical assistance, and opportunities to build the fourth industrial revolution in Myanmar, it will come. And let's all do this together. Thank you.